This video is sponsored by CuriosityStream. Get access to my streaming video service Nebula when you sign up for CuriosityStream using the link in the description. Hey, you know what's a great band? LCD Sound System. Made some of the best songs of the 2000s, Losing My Edge, All My Friends, Daft Punk is Playing at My House. They broke up in 2011 and they made a great documentary about their final days called Shut Up and Play the Hits and you can watch it and so much more on CuriosityStream, a subscription streaming service with thousands, literally thousands of documentaries and nonfiction titles. Go to CuriosityStream.com slash Todd in the Shadows and you will get an entire year for just $14.79. That's nothing. Not only is that a 26% discount on the regular price, you will also get free access to Nebula, a streaming video platform built by and for independent creators like Lindsay Ellis, Minute Physics, and myself. So you will get all the high budget premium content you get on CuriosityStream plus all the independent video creators on Nebula. Once you use the code and get CuriosityStream, you get a welcome email from Nebula giving you access and you'll have access to both services. So sign up now, click the link in the description, and enjoy. Thank you, and on with the show. done this one yet. Ladies and gentlemen, this is One Hit Wonderland, where we take a look at bands and artists known for only one song. And today, we are once again going to party like it's 1999. The last good year. Now, I've talked before about what a towering year 1999 is in pop culture. To me, it's not even really part of the 90s, or even a measurement of time at all. It's more like its own separate genre of music. Not necessarily a good genre, but certainly a distinct one. Genre of street parties, brightly colored McG videos, and an endless supply of almost obnoxiously happy energy. And today, we are going to look at maybe the most 1999 song ever made. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Mambo number five. A little bit of Monica in my life, a little bit of Erica by my side, a little... To think, we once lived in a world where Mambo number five didn't exist. Even for the genre free-for-all of the late 90s, this was an odd one out. Mambo? Seriously? There was no reason to expect a Mambo song to get big. But Mambo number 5 was simply too much of an earworm to be denied. If you have been alive at any point in the past 22 years, you probably know this song back to front. And you can blame that entirely on the energy of its singer, a mystery man in a fedora named Lou Bega. He danced, he mugged, he sort of quasi-rapped, and somehow he redefined Mambo for a new generation. Like someone just says the word Mambo and you're not generally gonna think of Tito Puente or anyone from the 50s. No, the first notes that pop into your head are Not to say that this is a particularly respectful entry into the Mambo genre. Some will tell you it's the worst song of all time, but love it or hate it, and for the record, I'm not really fond of this song at all, you couldn't stop it. It was a massive worldwide smash, and it still basically is. It has barely faded at all since the 90s, and that deserves some respect. So we're gonna do a deep dive on Mr. Bega, the walking anachronism with an alleged string of ladies in his wake. So let's put a little bit of Lou Bega in our lives. Why don't we start way back? Okay, in the mid to late 1940s, most of the world was basically rubble. But one of the few places on Earth not blown to shit during the war was Latin America, and so for a little while there, this whole area was very hot. Brazil, South America, the Caribbean were the source of all the trendiest fashions and styles, and especially music. The rumba, the tango, and then the mambo. Here is the new music of Perez Prado. One of the mambo's biggest practitioners was Perez Prado, the Cuban band leader who moved to Mexico and spread the mambo all through North America, including one hit in 1950 called Mambo Number no. 5. As far as I know, there is no Mambos 1 through 4. There is a Mambo Number no. 8, though. And then a few years later, rock and roll happens, ending Mambo and all the other big band genres and closing the book on an entire era of popular music. And that is where that story ends. Until we get to that magical period called the mid-90s. 
The Cold War threat of nuclear annihilation is past. Democracy is spreading across the globe. There is absolutely not a goddamn thing in the world to worry about. Or at least that's how it feels at the time. So suddenly music gets a lot more colorful and silly and weirdly very retro. For our purposes, the most important movement is the lounge revival, which brought back a lot of the popular non-rock genres of the 50s and 60s. You know, the easy listening, space age pop, bossa nova, and so on. Directly related to that is the swing revival, which is much more popular for a brief period, and that one brings back the sound of the big bands. But 1998's neo-swing movement is quickly supplanted by 1999's Latin pop explosion, which dominates the conversation for the entire year and sends out shockwaves that we are still feeling today. There was an unexploited intersection of all these trends, and one man decided he was going to be the first to exploit it. His name is Lou Bega, and you might assume that, like the genre he adopted, he came from Cuba. Or at least somewhere in that vicinity, perhaps Afro-Latino, Afro-Caribbean in some way. He is none of those things. He is German. Yes, German. His people's dance music sounds like this. Okay, but you look at him, clearly he's not like fully ethnically Deutsch, so uh, are his parents Cuban? Or anywhere close? No, not at all. His mother is Sicilian, his father is Ugandan. You might have thought differently from his name, but that's not his real name. His real name is David Lubega. Just a tiny change, but for these purposes it's huge. Lubega as a last name, that's pretty distinctly African, but change Lubega to Lubega and... I mean look at that, you could easily guess that it's short for Luis Bega Rodriguez or something. So how does a German Ugandan Sicilian wind up wanting to mambo for a living? According to him, he discovered it on a trip to Florida. So basically he's that friend of yours who did a semester abroad and came back with an accent. But is that even true? His manager, Guar Biesenkamp, he claims that mambo was his idea. He was the one who loved mambo and came up with Lou Bega's image and style and that Lou Bega actually wanted to be a rapper at first. In fact, you can see and hear a much different Lou Bega on this one-off German band's dance track from 1997. Let's say that I don't think he was the most technically gifted MC of his generation. But Biesenkamp says that, unlike other rappers in the Euro scene, Lou Bega was down for whatever. And so he eagerly got on board this Mambo project, and out came the pencil mustache, matching pinstripe suit and hat, and a nice old sample to build the persona around. The other day, a friend of mine sent me something called Mambo Number Honk. It's Mambo Number 5 played entirely with bike horns. He sent it to me because it was, quote, the sound of pure chaos, so naturally I had to hear it. I listen to this and I can feel myself losing all contact with reality. But there's a question that I really have to ask myself. Is this really any different? than Lou Bega's actual Mambo number no. five. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Mambo number no. five. One, two, three, four, five. Bega's Mambo number no. five is built around the riff from Perez Prado's Mambo number no. five. The lyrics about Monica and Sandra and Rita, those are all Lou baby. I guess I realize now why I've never covered Mambo number no. five before, which is, what is there to discuss? It just is what it is. A little bit of Monica in my life. A little bit of... <sighs> well, I will say this about it. Mambo number no. 5 is basically the exact ideal model of the classic annoying one-hit wonder. Impossibly catchy, an undeniable earworm, no one was surprised that it became a big hit, and yet it seemed to become extremely popular without anyone really enjoying it that much. Yeah, 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 not without anyone enjoying it. Like, a wedding DJ who throws on Mambo Number no. 5 will reliably keep the good vibes flowing, but I cannot imagine someone saying that Mambo Number no. 5 is their favorite song, unless they're like 10. 
because Mambo number no. 5 is an update of an old timey genre, it's somehow simultaneously timeless and extremely dated. It could not have been made in any other year but 1999. It's got all the non genre specific hallmarks of the late 90s. <laughs> DJ scratches, the samples, the, the bouncing late 90s beat, all of these things add up to make the song not really Mambo, or even a modern updating of Mambo. Like this did not lead to a full genre revival. There was a thriving swing subculture, and Latin pop and salsa were everywhere, but Mambo the genre did not really gain any benefit from Mambo number no. 5. There were no other Mambo crossovers, Mambo did not become more mainstream than it had already been, the album was called A Little Bit of Mambo, and that's what you get, a little bit, and no more. So even though Lou Bega made a lot of money, he's not really in the conversation with any other musics. He is to Mambo what the Black Eyed Peas are to hip hop. Like yes, they use the idioms and sonic palette of the genre, but that's not really their genre. Their real genre is annoying. That's where Lou Bega fits in. And part of the reason why the song is kind of a joke is just Lou Bega himself. He turns it into basically a vaudeville song. He's singing about how he's got girls, 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 and he's waggling his eyebrows. If this song weren't so family friendly, he'd be chomping on his cigar, you know, ha cha 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 cha. Like, Mambo was a sweaty, dynamic genre, but it was also a classy one with its ritzy nightclubs and press tuxedos, and there's just no dignity to this. It's an aggressively stupid song. But goddamn, is it catchy. One, two, three, four, five. To this day, I can't count to five without going one, two, three, four, five. Little bit of Monica in my life. If you put the list of girls in front of me, I could get it in the correct order without even trying. It's Monica, Erica, Rita, Tina, Sandra, Mary, Jessica. Easy. The man knows how to write a hook. It's one of the stickiest songs ever made. I don't think even haters were surprised that it was a hit. It's just so catchy, it was everywhere. I even remember the Disney version. Did Lou Bega have sex with Donald Duck? Is that the implication here? And that was not even the only kids cover of this. UK cartoon Bob the Builder did his own version a couple years later. A little bit of timber and a soul. It's funny this was so popular with kids considering it's about the parade of girls plowed by Lou Bega. For the record, he says this was inspired by his real life exploits and that all those girls are real. Convenient that all their names rhymed. But even the sex is cartoony. He's like the horny wolf in the Red Hot Riding Hood sketches. For what it's worth, I did see an interviewer ask Bega if he thought the song was, you know, hashtag problematic, and he said no, but the article said he'd clearly thought about this before. If you want my opinion, I think you'd have to try real hard to be offended by Mambo number no. 5. You can't run, you can't hide. Okay, maybe I wouldn't have written that line, but the song's way too silly to take seriously on those terms. Like, have you heard anyone get mad at it for being sexist? Of course not. Raunchiness isn't offensive anymore when it's retro. That's the rule. And to be fair to this song, for all that I don't like it, I also can't really bring myself to dislike it. I heard it over and over again in 1999, along with every other major pop hit. And that was around the time I discovered that I was just a natural born hater. I was like, this sucks and that sucks, I'm not listening to this shit. And yet, I don't remember ever really objecting to this song. It was just too catchy to turn off. If I were maybe a tiny bit older, I would have been like, that stupid idiot crap for babies. If I were a tiny bit younger, maybe it would have been my favorite song for a little while. As it is, I just kind of grudgingly accept it. I mean, who wants to be the person who hates Mambo number no. 5? Not me. I guess it's fine. But that doesn't mean I wanted any more of the guy. A little bit of Lou Bega in my life was plenty. But Lou Bega was not yet done. No man has ever given off one-hit wonder vibes like Lou Bega did. It was written all over him the second he introduced himself. So, you might imagine that he immediately disappeared after his one song. That is not true. I was basically watching MTV and VH1 non-stop at the time, and I remember there was a short-lived but serious push to give him a second hit. He's got a girlfriend everywhere! Ah! 
His follow-up song to Mambo No. 5 was called I Got A Girl, and on it you can really see Lou Bega expanding his persona on this second song into new creative directions. Got a girl in Paris, I got a girl in Rome, I even got a girl in the Vatican Dome. See, the first song was a list of all the girls he's banged, but here he switched it up with a list of places where all the girls he's banged are from. Africa, America, Europe and Australia, Asia, Canada, I take them on to marry ya. Lou Bega. He has sex with women! I don't remember seeing that one, but I do remember his other single, Tricky Tricky, about a scheming girl. She likes access to your bank account, she likes dollars, she likes British pounds. I ain't saying she's a gold digger. I can't believe I still remember this, but I remember him being quoted that Tricky Tricky was like his gender flipped version of No Scrubs. You know, like we were all thinking, this is exactly like No Scrubs. I cannot find this quote now, but I swear it was real. I think he must have been worried about seeming sexist, so he was trying to make the song seem like it was part of a two way conversation. But seriously, come on, Lou. Scrubs. First off, there was literally already a gender flip version of No Scrubs. And two, if you were gonna compare it to any other hit from 1999, it would obviously be Live in La Vida Loca, another song about a crazy wild chick who likes money. Neither of these songs did anything in America. I Got a Girl did okay in some countries, Tricky Tricky did not. Vega also got sued around this time. Vega said Mambo No. 5 was a new song, so he gave himself songwriting credit on it, which, you know, seems fair to me. He did write all the lyrics. Prado State said it was a straight cover and demanded all the credits. And Vega eventually won, but it was rough going for a while. Incidentally, all you 90s kids probably remember his song from the credits of Stuart Little, called One Plus One Is Two. Baby, show me one plus one is two. Show me all the things that you can do. It is such a ripoff of Mambo No. 5 that the Prado estate should have sued for this one also. And uh, I think that pretty much exposes the flaw in the Lou Bega persona. He's got one trick, and he already did the best version of it the first time. He was even referring to himself as Mambo King, and Mark Anthony, who is not a guy who holds back, actually said, does he know how insulting that is? Like, no, you are not Tito Puente, bro. That'd be like Bruce Willis calling himself the King of Blues. So by the end of the year 2000, it was clearly over and done for him. Or was it? Has he ever done anything else? Who boy, has he ever? His second album led off with something called Gentleman, which is about how Lou Bega is, and this will shock you, a total pimp who is really successful with ladies. In a sexual way. <laughs> Gentleman. <sighs> Just a gigolo, and everywhere I go. He followed that with a cover of Just a Gigolo, which I thought was going to be way too obvious a song choice for this guy, but actually this is a pretty good rendition of it. Nobody cares for me. Nobody. Lou Bega is going to be a DLC in Cuphead, by the way. But this was not even a hit in Germany. Him having a second album at all, that's already pushing it for a novelty one-hit wonder. But sure, you can give him one more shot to make something happen, but he didn't. And by this point, Vega himself was getting sick of his biggest hit. Like, can you even imagine? I sure was, and I wasn't performing it every night. So after the second album, he decided to step away from showbiz to spend more time with his family. And then he goes away forever, right? No, that is wrong. He eventually returned in 2006, and actually, would you believe he was only 23 when Mambo No. 5 came out? I mean, he could be lying about his age, but even if he is, he's still way younger than I thought he was because this man is still going more than 20 years later, and he basically looks exactly the same. I had your boy with all my heart. Every few years, he manages to put out something new. Granted, none of them really hit, and I wouldn't really recommend any of it. Here's the one about how you're beautiful, even if you're fat. I love your curves and believe me, it is every pound. Fellas, you gotta stop making songs like this. He also has tried to make songs more recently that were less aggressive and less 90s. But I'm the king of Bungle, baby, I'm the king of Bungle Ball. He seems a bit ill-equipped to make music this laid back, I'd say. If you're not gonna make really obnoxious dance music, what's the point? But I gotta be honest, I'm really impressed that he's kept this going for so long. 
This was a shtick basically forced on him 20 years ago, and he seems to have absolutely no regrets. So on that note, here is his most recent single, Scatman vs. Hatman. And I'm the Hatman. A remix of and tribute to previous one-hit Wonderland subject, Scatman John. To the feet of the hat scat mambo. Everybody's saying that the scat man stutters but does and never stutter when he sings. Scatman was a guy whose music and story I enjoyed a lot more, but I gotta admit, who Bega has that same kind of heartwarming vibe? This is a guy who found his one thing and just kept riding it. I kind of admire the tenacity. And wherever he shows up, people seem to be having a good time. Make this guy just like 20% cooler? He's basically Pitbull, right? You can't knock the hustle. Mmm, no. But I kind of want to say yeah. A little bit of Monica in my life. Here's a guy who could be embarrassed by his one hit or resentful that he never had a second, but he's out there still living life to the fullest. I don't really like Mambo Number no. 5, and you're gonna have to really stretch to convince me that it's a good song. But would the world be missing something without Mambo No. 5? Yeah, I think so. If you like it though, maybe check out some actual Mambo too. Mambo number five.